So welcome uh, everybody to, um, uh, to this seminar of the uh, Division of Mathematical Sciences of uh, Nanyang Technological University. So our guest today is uh, Dr. Manu Nathri Gandhi from the University of Pretoria. And uh, so Manu Nath, uh, he got a, a PhD in the Indian Institute of Science. And uh, as I said before, he's, he's a senior lecturer in, in Pretoria. And um, well, the, the, the reason why we invited him is because, uh, well, already for a number of years, uh, he has a background in, in uh, non-autonomous dynamical systems. And uh, for a number of years, he, he has been the, one of the people who have been uh, working very seriously in establishing uh, mathematical, mathematically solid uh, foundations for problems that have been the last few years become uh, very fashionable in relation with uh, recurrent neural networks, what we call reservoir computing and uh, the learning of dynamic processes. So um, already when these topics were not so uh, popular, let, let's, let's put it that way, uh, Madunath, he was already working with some of the founding fathers of reservoir computing. So Madunath, he has papers with uh, Herbert Jagger. And um, uh, well, to, to this day, some of his results uh, are um, Consider as, 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 as uh, yeah, found are part of the foundations of this topic. Uh, when uh, you think of the of the mathematical results that go with it, uh, when it comes to reservoir computing and, and recurrent neural networks, if you look at the literature, there are lots and lots of papers having to do with empirics, with specific applications to engineering, forecasting, econometrics. But when it comes to uh, mathematically solid uh, yeah. results. Okay. There are not so many out there. So let me, yeah, let me mute. Very good. So um, in any case, that, that that's what uh, Manunath is going to be talking about. And um, so uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, if we manage with all these uh, bureaucratic problems that are associated with uh, coming to Singapore in, in, during a pandemic, so Manunath, he will be spending part of his sabbatical uh, starting from April here in, in NTU. So, um, so I just hope that we have a chance to have him here in person. And, and then in that case, uh, yeah, we will all have a chance to be able to discuss with him and, and, and uh, uh, and to pose him questions and to, uh, I hope, uh, collaborate with him. So, um, Manjunas, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for, uh, for accepting this invitation. Thank you, Professor Ortega, for the very kind and uh, generous introduction. So I hope I can live up to some of uh, the things what you said right now. So, um, so thank you very much uh, once again for everybody for uh, getting into this uh, Zoom call wherever you are. Good afternoon and uh, good morning wherever you are. Okay, so um, so my title is data to equations, um, um, a mathematical approach uh, is, is somewhat catchy. It's not any data, but it's dynamical data that I would expand and then I'll explain rather. Okay, so. Sorry, I'm not able to move, get more my, more my cursor. Okay, all right. So uh, let me begin with the acknowledgements. Uh, so numerical work uh, in my talk uh, are results obtained from- uh, K to the power of minus P. Uh, K is the number of uh, uh, points that are in the node. So two HANA students, um, Adrian D. Clark and Bernie Notier. Uh, they are ex honor students at the University of Pretoria. And then uh, I've been uh, not working in vacuum. I've, I've been uh, receiving helpful comments uh, by a lot of people. I've just listed a few here. And, uh, and I've been tr tremendously influenced by the works of these people. And I also should mention that I've been uh, very economical in citing the results of some of uh, these people, uh, some of these uh, researchers. Uh, so forgive me for this. Uh, so many results, uh, which I initially state, appear in some form, which are, which are somewhat similar, or stronger, weaker in uh, other papers as well. Uh, so let me <clears throat> get to the uh, topics. 
Right. So getting mathematical models uh, from repeated measurements from experimental science is now uh, engraved in modern science. Okay. So uh, we want these kind of models for forecasting, for making better predictions, for making better decisions, for controlling systems, um, um, and so on. So these models can be um, broadly classified into three categories. One are interpretable models, which establish a relationship between internal physical variables. <clears throat> Excuse me. So examples of this is, um, so classical mechanics equations can be rediscovered from data. So some recent work I point out to a work, work by Brunton and others in uh, 2016, uh, what they do there is uh, they assume um, that um, the uh, <clears throat> vector field of a model is a linear sum of certain polynomials or some kind of trigonometric functions. And they actually find the weights of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, the linear sum so that they can actually get a vector field that is a differential equation model for the data at hand. Um, <clears throat> although it's very attractive, one of the disadvantages of this uh, kind of modeling is we need <clears throat> plenty of, uh, I mean, maybe uh, we need almost all information in the sense, access to all state variables of the system, which is rarely available in practice. Uh, the next uh, type of models are partially interpretable models. So these are models, for instance, which capture certain modes of the dynamics. So for example, just like how you capture Fourier coefficients to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to tell something about a particular signal, so they capture modes of the underlying dynamic, dynamics, and they're based on the Koopman operator. So uh, the Koopman operator is one of the new trends or the fashionable uh, uh, way of, for forecasting uh, methods, I mean, for forecasting uh, dynamical systems, mainly because it is, <clears throat> uh, it has a good uh, theory, it has got a, it's got a good mathematical theory. The last one is uh, the non-interpretable models. That's what I am looking at. So these are models uh, ranging from Takanskele embedding models to models with hundreds of auxiliary variables. And these are obtained through machine learning methods, typically. Um, so most of the results that I state here uh, are uh, available in a less technical article, which is, which is uh, below. Okay, so let me get to the non-interpretable models. So working mechanisms, as uh, Professor Ortega mentioned, they're not well understood. You still have, I mean, um, thousands and thousands of uh, papers, uh, uh, each telling about some good uh, improved numerical results but the working mechanisms are still not well understood. Um, and this often leads to poor long-term consistency. So what works for one model uh, may not work for the other. And also if you run for a longer time, the forecasting actually gets worse for a period of time. Um, now we want to get over this and uh, so design better systems. So non-autonomous dynamical systems theory helps resolve some difficulties. Uh, one of the advantages <clears throat> um, of these kind of machine learning models is that these models, they, they can capture all intricacies involved in the entire problem. And uh, they rely on mapping data onto a high dimensional space. So high dimensional space, is, uh, is something uh, which is scary, but uh, usually we try to project data from a dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, but we do the reverse here. So the grass is actually greener on the other side of the fence where the other side is actually the high dimensional uh, space. Okay, so why high dimensional space? So initially whenever 
um, these people who conceived these models, that is the, the, the large dimensional machine learning models, they were inspired by bio-inspired, I mean, they were, they were inspired by biology. So a stimulus to the human brain um, is uh, actually uh, gives a response in thousands of neurons. So effectively that means the data that's incoming is mapped into a, mapped onto a high dimensional space. Okay. <clears throat> so the methodologies that I discuss are Takan Steele embedding, reservoir computing methods. Uh, for lack of time, I would not go into the data driven methods using the Kupman operator, although there is a good link between these uh, three techniques that I mentioned. So there are other powerful methods uh, for which I will not have time and I do not have uh, much uh, information either. All right, uh, so let me start with some basics, discrete time dynamical systems. So a dynamical system is a tuple. Um, so in the context of this talk, uh, there are two entities here. U is a compact metric space and T which maps U to U is a subjective self map. So this subjectivity is not a strong assumption uh, when you consider certain class of systems like chaotic systems, otherwise it becomes too strong. But I'm interested in more complex systems and that's why I put this subjectivity. The dynamics is generated according to this rule, U subscript N plus one is equal to T acting on UN. I've just uh, omitted the uh, braces uh, just for brevity of notation. So T is acting on UN. This is not a linear transformation. This is a nonlinear perhaps anything, uh, any self map. I don't even assume the map is continuous. Okay, so a sequence U subscript K is an orbit of T if it satisfies this relation. So uh, you if you keep obtaining the iterates of uh, an initial condition, so T acting on UN, you get the forward orbits. And because the map is subjective, you could also get a backward orbit. So basically you can define a sequence which is valid for all integers. Okay, and uh, so for each initial condition, you have an orbit. So if, what do I mean by initial condition? If I start with U0, it's a left infinite trajectory could be uh, unique or not unique, depending whether T is invertible or not, but the forward trajectory is always unique. So where do we get such kind of dynamical systems? Examples are time T maps of flows of autonomous differential equations. So we can discretize uh, ODEs and get maps. Uh, then self maps are dynamical systems in their own right. So there is a big school in which uh, they think that uh, maps are for more fundamental in modeling than uh, actually uh, going for differential equations. Okay, now um, we all know in topology that um, or in other branches of science, uh, sorry, in mathematics, we have equivalence between uh, two spaces or two groups, things like that. Here we're gonna talk about equivalence of dynamical systems. So consider a dynamical system and uh, UT and let V be a topological space. So V is some topological space and Suppose I have a homeomorphism phi, which maps U to V, then, uh, so we already have a map T there. So we could, phi is a homeomorphism. So I could actually invert this map, go this way, and then come back and define a new mapping, which is S. So uh, S is a dynamical system on V. So probably this phi inverse should have been this way, but it depends on how you read the composition. It doesn't matter. Okay, so basically the message is, if I have a dynamical system on the top, which I indicate by this uh, T mapping U to U, and if I have a homeomorphism phi, I can actually get a map S on the system, uh, sorry, on the, on the bottom. So uh, why do we need such a system? Well, the, it's just like, instead of studying this system, I could study this system. And if I know something about this system, perhaps this system could be uh, 
easily amenable for analysis. So for example, in this case, uh, this is a logistic map, um, which is a nice uh, polynomial. Uh, it's got a nice polynomial expansion, it's differentiable, then you could do a lot of things. So you could, uh, you know, perhaps analyze what happens uh, with T or vice versa. So this T is the, what is called as the tent map. It has got this expression. So I could study one system in place of the other. So here in this case, uh, if I start with an initial condition, say 0.4, then uh, the, uh, uh, the, this map phi, which is a homeomorphism, actually maps to a certain value on the space V. So this is the space V here. And this, um, on this initial condition, the map S acts, and that is equivalent to actually um, having the system run a uh, once time step here. Uh, so uh, we could actually, when we actually move this uh, value of S of X back into the space through the inverse transform of uh, phi. So basically uh, it's uh, just like reading two uh, books which are written in two different languages and they have a word-to-word -word mapping. And then you can stop uh, reading one book uh, in one language and switch to the other book. And you basically get uh, the same information if there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the words. Okay, so, um, uh, so one important, uh, uh, you know, like um, objective is uh, we want to uh, study the, you, you know, we want to map uh, the data from one system to the other. So for that, I would like to stress, uh, I mean, I would like to give two definitions. The system on the top is called an extension of the system on the bottom, regardless of what phi is. Uh, when I say phi, regardless of what phi is, phi I assume to be um, a continuous map, uh, subjective map. In the previous uh, slide, I assumed it to be a homeomorphism. In the case of a homeomorphism, uh, the system um, at the bottom, we say is a semi-conjugate semi to U of T. But regardless of what, whether it's a semi-conjugacy or a conjugacy, the system at the bottom, I call that as a factor the system at the top. So why, why do I call it as a factor? It's because the complexity of the factor is less than or equal to the complexity of the extension. So I do not, I'm not going into details of how complexity is measured. If you want to look at uh, that definition, it is uh, topological entropy. So topological entropy of the system at the bottom is smaller than the, uh, less than or equal to the topological entropy of the system at the top. Okay, next topic. Um, so having got uh, this basic idea of equivalence of uh, two dynamical systems, I would like to talk about Tacon's delay embedding. Okay, so um, often we do not have access to full states of a dynamical system, but observations. So what do I mean by observations? So if I have WT is an unknown dynamical system, and WN is an orbit, okay? We could have access to uh, states U0, U1, and so on, where U subscript N is theta acting on WN, where theta is some observation. So in general, there is no function which maps UN to UN plus one. So if you plot UN plus one versus v UN, you don't get a graph of a map. You could get some, you know, sort of random, randomly distributed uh, curves which uh, will not give you any information of how UN plus one is related to UN. However, if you um, stack some previous or maybe a, a N successive values or K successive values, then we could perhaps establish a relationship between this and that. So, here, what I'm doing is I'm stacking k continuous values, say k successive values, and then I have the next k successive values. So there could be a relation f subscript theta. And this, when I say relation, I, it could be a well-defined map. And Packard's delay embedding is one of those uh, great results which tell you 
the existence, I mean, we tell you the conditions under which F theta exists. So here is the basic idea. So I have a certain topological space, which is called a manifold, a W. And here is, is a one dimensional manifold intuitively. It's, it's, it's homeomorphic to uh, locally to a subset of R. So, um, so basically uh, there is a function T which actually evolves. Um, so there is, a, there is a dynamical system on this object. And then I make an observation. Say these observations are looking like that. Observations are theta mapping from W to R. Then I stack the previous uh, two values. Uh, so this is a one dimensional manifold. And then uh, Tuckens delay embedding says that uh, the delay is good enough uh, for you to you know, obtain a map F theta, which takes this delay vector or the delay coordinates that I would call into the next delay coordinate. Okay, so T is acting on each of these values. So why is this useful? This is useful because uh, if you have enough data points uh, of uh, these delay coordinates, and then you could learn this function F theta using some machine learning or some curve fitting algorithm, and you could start forecasting this uh, data. So what do I mean by forecasting? So if I apply, if I hit F theta with this, I get the next value here, as you observe on the top, and then we can uh, keep using this um, um, in future. So this probably a typo there. So this is just uh, theta of u. So please ignore that. Okay. So why is this uh, method so attractive? It is because uh, this dynamical system that we have at the bottom is topologically conjugate to the system at the top. So that means effectively whatever you do here, we, we are also observing that in this new reconstructed space of delay coordinates. So F theta is a map that you learn. Now that is, uh, I mean, this was the great point of Tuckens delay embedding. So what is the flip side of it? Um, well, there is, um, if I, this, this is, not very robust uh, to noise as empirically observed. So if for some reason, the initial condition or one of the data points move outside this embedded object. So this is basically embedded into the reconstruction space. By embedding, I mean this uh, W is uh, uh, homeomorphic uh, onto its image through the delay coordinates. So, uh, so this uh, space here, uh, this embedded object need not be an attractor of this map F theta. So when I say F theta was actually defined on this uh, embedded object, but when you learn due to noise, you learn F theta outside uh, this embedded object as well. And uh, if you use a neural network, for instance, you are basically whatever input comes in, it goes out. So because of the expanding nature of chaotic maps, initial, if, if I have a data point here uh, at some time step, it could get overthrown uh, far away from the system, far away from the uh, embedded object, and this could give rise to a lot of errors. So that's uh, the Tuckens uh, delay embedding theorem formal statement. So the important thing is if the delay is greater than uh, 2D plus one, where D is the dimension of the attractor, then you have uh, this uh, topological conjugacy uh, that I observe. So this is the uh, topological conjugacy that was uh, indicated in the previous diagram. Okay. So, um, so uh, I mentioned one reason that uh, the embedded object is not an attractor. There is Another um, uh, source of errors, uh, which is called the functional complexity. So I'll get to the figure on the left. You see a graph of a function. So this graph is uh, widely behaving. And as you see, if you have very few data points, uh, it's uh, difficult to interpolate or extrapolate to learn this function. Whereas the functions on the right are uh, relatively much, much simpler to learn. And we would like to learn a simpler map. So we do not have any results on how 
data gets mapped onto the uh, delay coordinate space using Takan's delay embedding. But we have empirical observations that as you increase the delay, in most cases, the functional, the, the machine learning uh, uh, results that you, machine learning, learning algorithm that you uh, use to learn that map F theta actually gives better results. Okay, so here is an example where I show that Takan's delay embedding results for, uh, for one of the systems called the Lorentz map, which I will introduce later, actually doesn't do very well. So on the left, I plot uh, the three principal component analysis values uh, so of the iterates of F theta. So these are certain values where, you've, where it indicates how the data is spread. Uh, so these are the principal component values of uh, the um, iterates of F theta. And these are the actual uh, principal components. And you see that the principal components are thrown out of the box uh, simply because of the fact that I mentioned earlier that a small error could leave you outside the embedded object. Okay, so uh, to overcome these challenges, we need new methods of processing uh, data coming in streams. Okay, data coming in streams means a time series, or it could be a multivariate time series. So we want uh, to map the data so effectively so that we want to get rid of this uh, problem that we face uh, due to Takan delay embedding. Okay, so map, mapping data into a higher dimensional space is the subject of the next discussion. So starting, uh, mapping static data into another space is studied in um, statistical uh, machine learning. So there is a theory. So here are uh, data sets of uh, coming from two different categories. And then if I use um, a simple mapping like this, the data gets linearly separated. And it's far easier to actually process, uh, you, know, to, you know, like uh, get information or do some forecasting or prediction, classification, whatever, on this space rather than on what, rather than what is on the left. So how can we do this for temporal data? So that was for static data, right? So this is not so simple. It's, um, it's a science by itself and it needs a lot of sophistication. Okay. So mapping the entire temporal data into a high dimensional space is, um, is the subject of this slide. And then I would like to, um, uh, go into a very ambitious task of forecasting data. So, um, so if, we, if I were to just map um, the temporal data, the, that is the entire temporal data onto a new value in a new space, I would have to find a function h, okay, which acts on the left infinite history of the data. So at each time step, so this was this is at the n minus one time step, and this is at the nth time step. I would have to act h on this data to get the new data point xn plus one. So here I get xn, and here I get x subscript n plus one. So this is a very painful way of implementing this kind of. Uh, mapping. That is, if you want to map the entire left infinite history of the data into one point. Now the question comes, why do I map only the left infinite history? Well, I, as time goes, you can run time in the forward direction, then you can get a sequence in the space xn, sorry, in the space x to get all the other points. So we are actually mapping from one sequence to the other sequence, but there is a causal nature in the mapping. So that is reflected in the time labels. Okay. So how do I avoid this? I can avoid this by taking the following, making the following, uh, I mean, uh, uh, perhaps uh, if you could uh, find uh, a relationship between uh, Xn and Un so that I could get X subscript N plus one. So this is the current state or the uh, mapped value in the high dimensional space. 
I don't have to get into the full left infinite history at time n. I could just use the value at time n and use that to get to this value x subscript n plus one. So could I do this? So basically I'm asking a question, does a map G exist which maps U n x n to x subscript n plus one? So for that, um, I also to need to make a more precise question, uh, sorry, to make the question precise, I want to map, uh, I want to make, sorry, I want to make this map H continuous. So how do I make uh, this map continuous? I need to endure a topology on this sequence space. So basically I get a sequence space uh, by taking uh, the Cartesian product of U with itself. And then I equip with certain metric or some product topology, with, which actually gives the product topology. So don't worry about it if you don't understand what is a product topology, but uh, um, so, um, uh, so I basically want a continuous map which behaves nicely. So um, I also need another condition. Can we retain the information in the input by observing the values of H? So what I mean is these values here should give, uh, should, should have the information of the input. So I'll make this question precise a little later. And uh, based on this, I can get to some theory. So uh, the theory is about non-autonomous dynamical systems. So I call this function G that I introduced in the previous slide, which was taking a value in the input and a value in the uh, high dimensional space X, which I call the state space and mapping into X. So I want to get a H out of this function, the H that I introduced in the previous slide. Okay, so this system uh, can generate dynamics according to this equation here, update equation. So this is some uh, input you end, this is an initial condition, not, not initial condition, a state value at time n, this gets updated according to this rule. So when I'm tempted to get a H, uh, I wanna get a H which depends only on uh, the inputs, not on the state. So I'm tempted to substitute Xn uh, uh, in terms of Un minus one and Xn minus one using this equation. And if I do this recursively, this is um, what I could probably get but I do not know if I could actually eliminate um, the uh, state variable from the equation. And we could ask a question whether such a map H exists where there is no state variable Xn involved in this, um, in this equation. So what do I need for that one? So we want G to lose track of its uh, internal states. So, uh, Heuristically speaking, G should forget its own internal state Xn when its entire left infinite input is considered. So this is uh, at the intuitive level. So we can make all of this uh, theoretically, uh, um, in a, um, we can give a solid theoretical background for this one. Okay, so let me talk about what are called the solutions of a dynamic driven system to relate to that function H that I mentioned here. So we call a function G, uh, which has this uh, mapping uh, U cross X to X as a driven system. So I will, I will not go into this definition. I just use uh, G to be a driven system. And I assume that U and X are always there behind. So examples, you have certain examples on, this, uh, on the right. So basically uh, this is one example, very simple trivial example. So the concept of solution is the following. We say a sequence Xn is a solution of G if it obeys this state equation for all time N, uh, uh, which is uh, taking values in the space of integers. So this is important that uh, uh, because we want, a, we want a certain trajectory in the state space X, uh, which satisfies this equation and the trajectory should extend to both negative infinity and positive infinity. So extending to positive infinity, there's no problem, but extending to negative infinity is an issue. So let's look at the same example that I mentioned here. So this is a driven system. 
So if I want to extend this, if I want to pick a value xn plus one and then try to find xn, and un is, uh, you can set it to be equal to one, for instance, for instance, for all n, then you see that xn explodes, okay? So not every forward trajectory has, it can be classified as a solution in this case. So what do we, uh, um, what can we say about the existence of solutions in this case? Uh, so when X is compact, we can always guarantee that there exists one solution. So for this example here, there always exists one solution and you can always verify that the only solution is uh, the constant solution, which is zero. Okay, uh, I should have mentioned that UN is identically equal to one in this case. Um, so, okay, anyway. Um, so what do I have uh, now? I have uh, the space U bar, which denotes the uh, sequence space of U. So this is the, this is the uh, by infinite product of U. I get, I get an element of U n. And this uh, theorem on the left tells that this one, uh, this input always gives rise to one solution. That means it satisfies uh, this equation here so I can find at least one solution. There could be many, there could be possibly infinitely many solutions as indicated in this model here. This model has, uh, this driven system has infinitely many solutions for any input. Okay, so, what we understand is I have an input sequence and I know how to map onto another space using uh, G, but this map, is, uh, this map is not well defined in the sense I could have multiple images on the uh, sequence space on the right. So how do I confine this, uh, make this map well, you know, like uh, um, mapping well-defined that is, mapping of an input sequence into a state sequence. So a definition, a driven system has the unique solution property. If for each input sequence, there exists exactly one solution X subscript K. So I do not want systems which, which could give more than one solution for a given input. So in that case, I can define a well map well-defined solution map, which I call as psi. Psi maps from a bi-infinite sequence to a bi-infinite sequence. And this map now is well-defined. It is not necessarily injective. So I could have two different input sequences mapping to the same solution. That is possible. But what is guaranteed is for each input, I have only one solution. So I do not have this multiple mapping that I defined in the previous case. Okay, so I, I want, I'm interested in systems having this unique solution property. Now this unique solution property has, has been studied very well in the machine learning literature as the echo state property. There are uh, various uh, versions of this uh, echo state property. I will stick to this definition of the uh, unique solution property. And uh, I mean, uh, there are plenty of uh, resources. If you just type uh, echo state property or you'll get a Scholarpedia page and then you will see a lot of uh, information. Okay. Now, I just don't want to forget my objective. My objective was to get this function H through the map uh, through that driven system G. So how do I get it? Okay. So here comes what is called as the input mapping theorem. So given a driven system G that has the USP, it always spits out a continuous map H which acts on the sequences, uh, left infinite sequences of the input uh, so that you get this uh, desired map that you wanted in the previous slide. So what is the theorem stating? The theorem is also stating that the value that you get, X, that is the Xn value that you get is the value of the solution at time n. So once you have the solution map, you can actually get the nth projection to get the nth value of X uh, of the solution. And that is equal to 
the value of the function h acting on this left infinite map. Okay, so this is what you see on the right. So the, for the data on this one, for the data inside the red block, h acts on it to give you the value xn, and h acts on the blue the stuff to get x subscript n minus one. Okay, so how do we catch hold of this single solution that we want? So the single solution that we want can be captured very easily. We start with an arbitrary value, and then as you uh, keep iterating, uh, we hope that, uh, so when I say arbitrary initial value, I said y subscript m, then I could iterate this system like this, and I could, I could perhaps expect that this converts to the actual solution. So can we really do this? The answer is yes. It is called the uniform fraction property, which basically essentially tells you that given an input and a solution for it, then we can uniformly approximate in the sense that uh, there is an integer n so, such that the true value and the actual value of the solution are within some epsilon range after some time, okay? That is called the uniform attraction property. The nice thing about this uniform attraction property is a driven system has the uniform, uh, unique solution property if and only if it has the uniform attraction property. So that's a very nice thing. So what we have um, done now is uh, I don't need an analytical expression of that function h. I could just randomly initialize initial condition and then if I keep iterating uh, the driven system, I would converge to the actual solution of the system. That is a consequence of the uni unique solution property. Okay, next I want to get into the talk of uh, whether information is preserved from one space to the other. So to that end, I define what is called a reachable set. So the reachable set of a driven system is simply the union of all elements of all the solutions, okay? So it is a subset of the space X. So I denote this as X subscript U. And you could have uh, this X subscript U to be a single point for this example that I mentioned earlier. And uh, you could have this to be the entire space. Okay, so it depends upon G. Now, we do not want very trivial uh, you know, values of X subscript U, and um, uh, we'll come to that a little later. But for now, for the point, from the point of information preservation, I recall what was the definition of topological semi-conjugacy that I introduced earlier. So I have one system on the top, I have another system on the bottom. So if I could establish a continuous map H, such that if I have data un minus one, un minus two up to a certain time, then I introduce a new symbol or a new value, input value v, which uh, is denoted by uh, you know, this concatenation of the left infinite input with the value v through this mapping sigma subscript v, then we get a non-autonomous dynamical system here. A non-autonomous dynamical system is because simply because we could be varying. This is not a single map, but I am extending the uh, knowledge of driven knowledge of uh, topological semi-conjugacy for autonomous dynamical systems to the non-autonomous dynamical systems. And I ask this question whether a function H exists such that we have this commutativity. Okay. So as before, I want this map H to be continuous and subjective. So uh, why is this important? Okay. So I give you examples of uh, responses of two driven systems. So uh, they differ by a parameter and uh, the, the uh, input is uh, the waveforms that is shown in black. And the uh, two responses, the responses for the system with parameter A is shown in red. The response for the system uh, uh, in, uh, with parameter B is shown in blue. As you see, 
uh, one of these responses actually look uh, looks to follow the input, whereas uh, the other response actually behaves very wildly. And this, it's very easy to construct such systems. Okay, you can just, uh, I'll just give an example a uh, little later. So um, I want to get hold of, uh, to the system on the, uh, you know, which, which actually mimics the input rather than which behaves wildly. So I want that uniform, uh, that is uh, that is the uni existence of uh, universal semi-conjugacy. Mind you, when I ask this question, does there exist a such a map H? This has got nothing to do with the map that I mentioned earlier, okay, which was taking the left infinite uh, values into the sequence, uh, into the state space. Okay, here comes a result. A driven system uh, has a, I mean, I call this map H as the universal semi-conjugacy whenever it exists. And here comes a result, which simply states that a driven system G has a universal semi-conjugacy if and only if G has the unique solution property. Further, H is exactly the map in the import mapping theorem. So H is given by this mapping, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So on the other hand, suppose if I ask a more subtle question. So suppose I don't assume USP, that is the unique solution property. And I ask if this diagram commutes, and then we actually find out that H would not be actually not continuous. Okay, so it's it's uh, the universal semi-conjugacy is an exclusive property of the uh, uh, systems with USP. Okay, now I say that uh, what I've said that uh, so far is I have universal semi-conjugacy. Semi-conjugacy means you have a factor system at the bottom. It has less complexity than the system on the top, but in the process, I don't want to lose information while mapping my data. So for instance, I look at this uh, solution mapping and then in this solution mapping, I have uh, input um, space where uh, um, uh, where I have two of these uh, solutions mapping, to, uh, sorry, two of these input sequences mapping to the same solution. So we have, whenever two inputs map to the same solution, we are losing information because XN doesn't have information about WN and UN separately. So we want to avoid this one. So I introduce a new condition, which is called the SI invertibility condition. We say that a map G, that is a driven system G is SI invertible. If uh, this uh, map where I fix X and I allow U to vary freely is actually invertible, okay? So what does this mean? This means that if I have two successive states, Xn and Xn plus one, in this equation, so that is Xn and X, X subscript to N plus one, I could recover actually U, U subscript to N. So in this case, we can have, we have a very nice result, in which case we can make the solution map injective, okay? So for every solution in the input space, I have a solution, or maybe, sorry, for every sequence in the input space, I have a solution in the state space. Okay, and that's, injective. Uh, so there's a one to one mapping. Okay, now I want to concentrate on in inputs coming from dynamical systems. The reason is I want to forecast this dynamical system. So you have basically two learning problems where in the first problem, I have full access to the data. So I have a sequence or a fragment of a sequence, which where it's related through the map P and then a more involved problem where we have observations from the data. Okay, so I want to introduce you to the concept of what is called a single delay dynamics. In single delay dynamics, what really happens is um, we want to observe two successive states on a solution and construct a space Y subscript T. We want to establish a new space Y subscript T, which is not looking at the entire solution in the solution space, but we are looking at tuples with successive values of the solution. And why am I interested in this will become much more clearer in the next slide, but I wanna build a new space for now. 
So I hope the definition is clear. So I've taken two successive values and identified this as a single point in the new solution space. Okay, so this is uh, the nice property of SI invertibility, which can be easily proven. So on this space YT, we can establish a map, well-defined map G subscript T, which takes you to the next tuple. So for instance, this is a tuple at uh, say times n minus three and n minus two, you get to the next value n minus two and n minus one. When do we get such a mapping? This is only when the inputs are restricted to the orbits of our dynamical system. Okay, so um, I, I should mention that I mentioned two learning problems. I'm looking at the first problem now and whatever theory that I develop here easily extends to this uh, more involved learning problem later. Okay, so we have a well-defined mapping. And this mapping GT between two successive, uh, sorry, between uh, the, the self map of GT on YT also gives rise to another mapping. Okay, this mapping is between two successive uh, states to the next value of the input. So this is very nice. If I could learn the dynamics on this space here, I could actually forecast the dynamical system. Remind you, these two tuples are evaluated from the left infinite history of the input starting, uh, starting from time n minus one, okay? So when I say starting, I move uh, the time backwards. So this mapping would actually help us to forecast the dynamical system. Okay, before that, I have mapped data from one space to the other space. Now I say that if the data is restricted to a dynamical system, I don't need a seek, I don't need an entire solution. I need just two values in the uh, space uh, YT, uh, maybe in the uh, solution space uh, to talk about the left infinite history. So can we establish a relationship between GT and T? And why is this important? This is important because if GT is, is called more complexity than T, most of the time your dynamics get, gets complicated. So GT should be either semi-conjugate to T or GT should be conjugate to T. So how do we actually uh, establish a semi-conjugacy? For that, what I do is I take the subspace of the left infinite sequences, which are determined by the left infinite orbits of the data. So here is an example of uh, um, a function t. I know that I'm running out of time. I'll try to uh, wind up. So t is a function which uh, looks like this. It has got two different uh, backward, uh, maybe it's got uh, two pre-images. Now, both of these pre-images map to u minus one. So you have basically two left infinite trajectories. So uh, I could take two more images of u minus two prime, and then you can uh, get actually uh, infinitely many left infinite trajectories. So the left infinite trajectories are not identical for a non-invertible map. Okay, now I want to collect all of these left infinite trajectories and define a function t hat so this left infinite trajectories is uh, the, what is called as the invert, inverse limit space of UT. And this inverse limit space uh, induces, actually the definition actually induces a mapping T hat, which is just T acting on each of these points. And this is actually a homeomorphism. And this new dynamical system is an extension of UT. And it's known in the literature that it does not have additional complexity than T when it's measured through topological uh, entropy, which I have not discussed. Okay, so here's the main theorem, the, which is called the causal embedding theorem. The causal embedding theorem tells us that if I have inputs coming from, uh, coming as left infinite trajectories of a dynamical system, I can embed those trajectories into two points in the space X or equivalently to one point in the space YT. 
And uh, this embedding actually gives rise to a map G subscript T, which is topologically conjugate to this map T hat whenever T is a homeomorphism, otherwise it is semi-conjugate. So the good thing is we have not introduced new complexity into the system. And that's, that's, that's actually why we require computing methods like this, uh, which I'm not, I mean, which I will show you the numerical results work very well. If I, uh, I just want to mention that G subscript T would exist if the map is SI invertible, but that is uh, a map which could behave very wildly and a small amount of uh, noise in the input could give rise to a lot of complexity in GT, which uh, GT behaves very wildly in that case. Okay, so these uh, systems with USB have got some very nice properties called the input related and parameter related stability properties. So uh, basically, which means that it's robust uh, to small changes uh, in the input and also small changes in the parameters of the system G. Okay, so in summary, what we have is we have a left infinite, uh, you know, subspace of uh, trajectories, and uh, each one of them gets is a, is getting mapped to a single point in this space y t. And I want to learn a function on y t. Okay, so this causal embedding theorem that I mentioned of dynamical system is remarkable in the sense that Whenever you change the driven system, dynamical system, your function GT changes. So the function GT changes, but this function H2 does not change. So H2 would be acting on a different sub. You know, here I should be more careful. H, this is H2 restricted on this inverse limit space, and we get different, uh, you know, images of the embedding. Okay. So one delay, uh, the single delay lag dynamics that I mentioned, or the one delay lag dynamics, would introduce a new map G subscript T, but how is it better? As I mentioned, the grass is greener on the other side. So we have, we can measure that complexity using the uh, generalized version of uh, multi, you know, like a PS, the Pearson correlation coefficient, which measures the, um, uh, the, the functional complexity of GT. As I observe um, that the functional complexity reduces drastically in the sense that this coefficient becomes closer to plus or minus one only if uh, yn is related, to, that is the input or the, the, the two uh, random vectors that I use in this measurement are linearly related. So what I meant, what I want is basically, I want to measure this correlation coefficient between these two successive values in the space uh, yt where gt acts on this. So when I uh, notice that for certain maps, there is a dramatic uh, change in the sense uh, like the correlation coefficient of the input is only this much. If I use a Takan's delay embedding, it just doesn't improve by too much, but with the reservoir computing, that is by mapping onto a very high dimensional space, uh, say like 100 and 1000, so we get a dramatic reduction in the complexity of the map GT. Okay, so the implementation details of GT, uh, we, instead of uh, implementing GT, we could learn another function gamma, which is the map that I mentioned, which takes two successive values of the solution into the next input. So the implementation details, I would skip, but what I want to mention on the right is in principle, if you do not have noise, you have exact equations from data. So what are these equations telling you? So G is known to us, G is the driven system that we use in practice. Gamma is the function that we learn on the, uh, that we learn from xk minus one to xk, you can learn through this through a curve fitting method or through a deep learning neural network, where whatever algorithm that you use, as long as it gives you a mathematical expression, you have this equation. And this equation has several auxiliary variables, x subscript k plus one. Uh, 
which I have indicated on the left is actually the auxiliary variable that we have introduced. So these are the states of the system G. UK was the input sequence that was given to you. We have an auxiliary system of equations, but these equations are principal are exact. Okay, so uh, the rest of the talk, I will talk about numerical simulations. And one of the advantages that I have with this uh, unique solution property is but whenever I'm there is let, loss. Let, let, yes. let me just, if you want to give us a few minutes for questions, uh, well, yeah, think of, if, think of not taking too much more time, yeah. Yeah, I, I will conclude in three minutes, so if that is fine, and then we could Very have Very good. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. All Thank right. you. Well, thank you. So if you have an extended system, then uh, we could... Uh, uh, so what, what is the difference between what we did with the Takan's embedding and this one is, around the embedded object, we build an attractor. And this attractor can be owed to the fact that G has the unique solution property. And... Uh, I have denoted uh, with the G subscript plus to include an extended dynamical system or a driven system that actually incorporates noise. Okay, so here is a summary. We uh, use SI invertibility and the unique solution property to get uh, beautiful, uh, uh, this beautiful conjugate diagram. And we explore these two uh, forecast dynamical systems. Now, I, all the theory that I told you was for when, uh, when all the states are available. So if you make only observations, then you could construct delay coordinates and feed that into the system and extend all the theory that I told to the map F subscript theta instead of the map T that I mentioned in all these slides. Okay, so here are some numerical results, uh, which I, for the Lorentz system, so these are cases where all the system states are predicted, are used. And uh, we forecast the dynamical systems using uh, data from 2000 samples. And uh, we plot uh, the uh, statistical information on this. So the, uh, the, the, on, the on the top here is the, uh, is, are the CDFs. And then uh, these are the histograms. And these are the um, attractors of the actual and predicted systems. Okay, so in the next uh, thing is we use an observation of the system. So we don't use uh, feed the entire data. So there is no mapping from UN to UN, UN uh, plus one. So however, uh, when we map it into the high dimensional system that GT works, so, so GV, we actually learn GT, and then uh, we are able to forecast this system like this. So we make a, we could also think of very complex observations and it works really uh, well as well. So these are uh, results for the full logistic map uh, where no previous uh, reservoir computing method has worked. And in, even in this case, uh, on the top is the reconstructed uh, tractor or the uh, reconstructed graph of the system. On the bottom is uh, the histogram. So we could also do this on the uh, systems that show intermittency. Again, uh, these are very uh, important systems where uh, intermittency are used in seismic models uh, and also in uh, models where disease modeling, where suddenly the disease uh, explodes as like suddenly you observe an earthquake. So there is a gap and then there is a sudden activity and then these maps are very difficult to learn. We are able to forecast such this, uh, dynamical systems as well. Another example is uh, the double pendulum example that you can actually see. Um, it, it exhibits a very wild behavior. Even in this case, we could reconstruct the attractor. So lastly, uh, we could uh, talk about uh, some real world data, in which case so we forecast uh, the South African climate data. So we observe data from, for about 12 years, uh, and then we forecast for the next three years, and the forecasted data and the actual data are actually plotted uh, on this picture here. Okay, conclusions. Um, so let me conclude. Um, so getting mathematical models from repeated measurements from experimental science is valuable in applications. We need that to forecast dynamical systems. So training models dates back to the 1980s, uh, thanks to the Takanas delay embedding. 
Machine learning algorithms generally outperform this, but uh, the long-term consistency and they don't work on all kinds of systems. So with this knowledge of causal embedding uh, that I mentioned, it's possible to obtain uh, model, models or equations which are actually uh, in principle exact, okay? So they, they show a lot of robustness to noise and um, empirically, long-term topologically and statistically consistent models can be obtained. So these are the references uh, for uh, the talk and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm willing to take them. Thank you. And my apologies uh, for overshooting uh, the time. Thanks a lot, Manjunath. So it was, uh, well, as usual, a beautiful mixture of uh, deep mathematics with uh, very interesting applications. So um, time for questions, comments. So uh, anybody in the audience? Bella, that's you're raising your hand. Yeah, can I? Yeah, may I? Go if ahead. There are no, but, yeah. Could you please? And, you know, thank you very much for the great talk. I mean, as usual. So I, I was enjoying it a lot. So could you please uh, make a comment about this gamma gamma map that you were well very briefly discussing in the end of the talk? So could you give uh, a little bit more explanation of uh, what that gamma map is? Exactly, and how do you learn it? Okay, all right. Um, once the map for GT exists, so, so I could learn GT instead of for the gamma and forget about everything. Uh, but there is an advantage of learning uh, the, the, to this roundabout way. So what is the advantage is, um, so this map gamma is nothing but uh, you know, like instead of learning two successive states, you actually take this xk minus one xk and map it to the next input value. So mind you, uh, this xk was depending upon uk minus one, uk minus two and so on. But if I take two successive values, I have a well-defined mapping gamma and that is ensured by the SI invertibility property that I mentioned. And this is, easier to learn because uh, the dimensions of, so you basically are learning XK minus one XK into UK. Uh, so UK is of a much smaller dimension. This, this, this in general has uh, hundreds of uh, dimensions. So you don't have to learn map uh, GT into a very high dimension. So once you learn UK, you can actually uh, use this along with XK to get to the next iterate of GT. So basically you are going about this uh, step without actually uh, having to learn this GT. The advantage of, another advantage of uh, this is uh, you could get this attractor around the uh, embedded object Y subscript T uh, thanks to the uh, function uh, uh, G, which has uh, the uh, unique solution property. So it is not just enough that U has the unique solution property, an expanded system. So suppose I expand the input space and I expand the state space. Uh, these expansions are determined by the amount of noise. And if that is actually sharp, I mean, it's actually mapped into the original space X, which is typically got through a nice saturation function, then we actually get this uh, attractor around YT. So that is the main advantage of uh, using gamma and gamma basically could be learned through any method. Here in our procedure, we learn through deep learning methods, uh, the details of which I did not have uh, time to explain, but it's, uh, learned, it's a feed forward neural network using the Karas library built on a, on a TensorFlow algorithm. And uh, you can find uh, this on the internet uh, very easily. So in all the systems that are used, uh, especially for um, uh, these systems here, we used uh, the same amount of uh, complexity in learning gamma in the sense that the amount of layers are fixed. I don't exactly remember um, the amount of, yeah, it has, there's a detail here. So there are 12 across 64 neurons in the feed forward neural network that we learn. So does that answer your question, Gurmila? Thank you. Yes, yes. 
right. Thank you. Very good. Other questions? For, for a change, let me ask you something about the empirics. Because, uh, well, I found very impressive this example with intermittency because those things, they are usually extremely difficult to forecast. So yeah. uh, how do you measure the quality of the forecast here? Because it's not MSE, right? Because you, if you compare the actual with the predictives, uh, uh, well, the intermittency doesn't happen at the uh, at exactly the same the same point. It's in distribution. How are you measuring the distance between the the the, the forecast and the actual time series? All right. Well, Thank the same you. thing applies to uh, the, the same thing applies to Lorenz because yeah. Lorenz the usual thing is that if you miss a turn when you go from one lobe to the other, then the MSC gets 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 spoiled. So, right. uh, how do do you do it in both cases in the same way? Or how what do you All refer right. to in in this case? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Uh, so the question is, um, you have uh, data here, which is the actual one, and you have the predicted data. And you observe that there is uh, some kind of similarity, but they're, they're not exactly at the same time. So how is this useful in practice for forecasting? Well, first step is, uh, as you, for example, in the seismic uh, data case, you keep observing data and, uh, and the forecasting uh, for the next few time steps is usually accurate than uh, what we uh, observe after a long time. So the point-wise error decree, you know, like becomes very large as time increases. So how do we measure them? Well, first we measure, we could actually plot uh, the successive values and get the, uh, the uh, graphs of these functions, which look pretty much similar. So on the left, you have uh, the noise added stuff. And uh, this is the forecasted uh, uh, graph that is UN versus UN plus one. So this is uh, something like a topological measure. Uh, for the statistical measure, we plot uh, what is called uh, the invariant measure. So all of these maps are very nice in the sense they are known to have invariant measures. So an invariant measure means uh, you could uh, use a single, uh, you know, like uh, you, you could use um, data to get to the uh, actual distribution of how the states actually behave, uh, states are after a very long time. So these are the histograms. Uh, so the histograms also have some kind of matching, uh, if not exact. Uh, this, so as you said, these are very difficult uh, to forecast. Uh, so that's why the accuracy is not very great, uh, but we still have a very good statistical model. Uh, however, in the case of the Lorentz system uh, that you asked, uh, so we, uh, uh, we get uh, these histograms as well. Now, uh, I have not shown you uh, the uh, Wasserstein distances, uh, but uh, the, we plotted also the Wasserstein distances uh, between these uh, to uh, to histograms, and then we observe that these values are much better than what we observe with uh, other methods like uh, the the Cindy and uh, other methods. So does that answer your question? Perfect. Yeah. No. That that's what they suspect by looking at the right. uh, at the uh, at the pictures. No, it's it's, it's great. It's truly really great. Thank other you. questions, people. Alabella, she wants to see her raise her hand. I'm sorry if I just abuse everybody's time here, but uh, I have two questions. I have two, but but maybe I ask uh, one that has to do with these measures uh, right. of similarity, and I just uh, catch on on Juan Pablo's question. So uh, when you are comparing those two series and you are using histograms. Well, yes. ultimately, what you are doing, you are you are breaking the temporal structure, right? So these are these are static statistical measures. So actually, what it tells you is that it doesn't matter when you visit that point, right? The main thing that you visit it, and uh, what we are interested in usually when we are forecasting, right? That is not that you happen to be 
uh, in that point at some, at some moment of time in the future, but you right. really know that tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, I will happen to be in that point. So did you try to look at least um, at, uh, for example, autocorrelations or, or some measures? Because you talked about this uh, Pearson correlation and uh, LAC measures, right? But actually, if you will be looking uh, also at the distributional um, distance measures between your observations, it still doesn't tell you whether you're really doing the forecasting uh, uh, properly, right? If you're interested in getting uh, correct temporal predictions. So did you try to look at the, at the correlations at least to see that um, uh, those are captured properly? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, just uh, oh. if you want to be brief. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we uh, pointed the uh, sorry, we plotted the pointwise uh, prediction error, which I don't show you here. And uh, this was actually very small for the first uh, few steps, like hundred or it depends on the system again. Uh, but uh, the larger point that I wanted to tell you is we we haven't done. I mean, I must admit that we haven't done the uh, autocorrelation. Uh, uh, you know, we haven't used the autocorrelation to compare how accurate is it is in the short time. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make a remark that if I were to come and say that uh, I have developed a chaotic model which runs for, you know, like uh, which gives very minimal pointwise prediction error, that would not be, uh, you know, um, admissible. For instance, because for small amount of noise, we could actually uh, get very different two trajectories, even though they are, uh, even though you have exact trajectories and everything, uh, small amount of, amount of computational errors. So uh, hence we resorted to the statistical distribution, but I haven't done this. But we observed that the point-wise prediction error is very small in, in you know, these uh, examples like the Mackey glass attractor and the uh, the Van der Poel oscillator, where, where it exhibits chaos. Uh, so there we observe very good, very very good, uh, you know, results with pointwise prediction error. But with the more complex systems, uh, it it quickly drops off. So hence we had to resort to this. So I don't think I have answered uh, your question uh, <laughs> very well in the sense like um, I um, we haven't done the uh, autocorrelation. Uh, method. So maybe uh, the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Marjana. It was, you know, the question that we're actually posing ourselves all the time. So it was, I, 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 you have better ideas. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Thank you. Pardon? I said, thank you. Thank you. I said that this is very complicated question. So actually, it's very, it's very difficult to actually to, to come up with a measure, right, that tells you that your forecast is good if you are not interested in the point wise forecast, but you are interested in capturing the similarity in the dynamics, right? Overall. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, maybe if I can put a point on this one. Uh, so I've just shown you the, uh, uh, you know, like the histograms. It doesn't tell you anything about the joint density. So in that case, uh, I'm doing uh, work with JP and then um, it shows that uh, the joint densities are also continuously varying in the sense that uh, if I, if the input uh, joint density is disturbed by a little, then uh, this, uh, the joint density of the uh, response also is, uh, is also um, uh, changes by that small amount. But this actually doesn't tell you that uh, how the joint densities are reflected in the reconstruction. So we are yet to get into this. Uh, so we are at the preliminary stage of uh, talking about uh, the, 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 uh, the, the joint densities. But then, um, I mean, I'm sure JP has a lot of uh, information about this, uh, about uh, how reservoir computing methods are used uh, for stochastic input processing. So I will leave it uh, to him to talk. Well, actually what I'm going to do because we are way over time. So I'm going to let people go and I will stop the recording. And then, uh, but nevertheless, I invite the others to stay. We can keep chatting here about, about all these interesting topics. If you have the time, Andrew, not. So, so. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. As long as you want. As long as you oh, want. Okay, very good. So I'm going to stop the recording. And then for the others, again, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your presence here. 
And um, the other thing that they wanted to uh, to repeat for those who arrived a bit later is that if, if everything goes well with administration, Manjunaski should be here in, in, in April. And um, and uh, yeah, I well, so, so many of us look forward to, to your visit, Panjunas. So again, mm -hmm. thanks a lot for the seminar. Thanks to all for your presence. And then we have another seminar in a related topic next uh, Thursday. But that time it will be in the morning. So for the Europeans, it's going to be a bit tough. So, uh, but we record them, so I can share with you the recordings. So um, yeah, see you later. <laughs>